Well, folks, we have just a couple of weeks until the big 2024 election, and Donald Trump has all the momentum. We'll get to that in a moment. First, in one week, Am I Racist? The decade's number one documentary streams exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. That is coming October 28th. Remember, you need a Daily Wire Plus membership to watch. Join right now at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code DEI for 35% off your new membership. Do not miss out. Okay, so the state of the race, we are now two weeks out from the election. Donald Trump currently has all the momentum, not some of the momentum, all the momentum. And this has been a wild race because the momentum shifts have been insane. And when Joe Biden was in the race, then Donald Trump had all the momentum. And then Joe Biden dropped out of the race and Kamala Harris was put into the middle of the race. And suddenly there was joy and suddenly there was wonder and all the momentum shifted over to the Democrats. And then the air slowly came out of the balloon. And it appears that Donald Trump has regained momentum, not only in the swing states, but nationally right now. In the battleground states, according to the Real Clear Politics polling average, Donald Trump leads in Michigan. He leads in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia. Again, if he were to win the election, all he needs to do is win Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia, and one of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. He is currently leading in the polling average in all three, according to Real Clear Politics. He also happens to be leading in Nevada. So if the election were held today, no toss ups, he would win 312 electoral votes, according to that Real Clear Politics polling average. In the national average, The spread is in favor of Harris by one point, but of the last six polls that have been taken, Donald Trump is now leading in four of them. So that essentially means that nationally speaking, it's a toss up. If it's a toss up nationally, Trump is going to win the election. In order for Kamala Harris to win this election, she probably needs to be up at least two and a half to three points in the popular vote. She does not appear to have those numbers behind her right now, unless the polls are very, very wrong. What's more, her campaign is flagging. She's totally disconnected from the American people. In fact, according to the Wall Street Journal, the way she is attempting to reach out now, she has been relegated to reaching out to the Liz Cheney voter. There aren't that many of them, folks. The people who just love Liz Cheney so much, the the disaffected Republicans who love Liz Cheney, and now are going to move on over from Donald Trump to Kamala Harris. Those people are incredibly rare. That number is vanishingly small. But according to the Wall Street Journal, Harris, who sharpened her criticisms of Donald Trump over the weekend, is expected to hold events on Monday with former GOP representative Liz Cheney in suburbs in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin that have been shifting away from the Republican Party. She is also hosting separate get-out-the-vote rallies later in the week with former President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama in Georgia and Michigan, swing states where Harris needs to run up large margins in the urban centers and suburbs. So she's now relying on a sort of halo effect of the Obamas to bring out the black vote in Georgia and Michigan. That is not going to work. Hillary Clinton tried the same thing in 2016. And she's relying on Liz Cheney to bring out the suburban vote in, say, Pittsburgh. Uh, Good luck with that. Apparently, she's trying to target voters who backed former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley over Trump in the GOP primaries. But let me make this very, very clear. Nikki Haley voters are not going to vote for Kamala Harris. One of the reasons that Nikki Haley voters really like Nikki Haley is, for example, her extremely pro-Israel foreign policy. They are not moving over to Kamala Harris, who, as we will see, is a double talker when it comes to Israel policy at best. So she is flailing around right now. How much is she flailing? She's flailing so much that the Wall- that the Washington Post editorial board put out a piece saying that what she should do in this campaign is commit to having a big 250th birthday celebration for the country in 2026. I'm not even kidding. So this is their strategy. They need to recapture the feeling of patriotism by pledging that in July of 2026, she will throw a giant party for the American semi-quincentennial. I'm sorry, this is what you got? This is what's in your bag? You got nothing. You got nothing. And you can tell that the momentum is with President Trump. So over the weekend, it was Kamala Harris's birthday. Kamala Harris decided that she was going to celebrate that with Stevie Wonder. She went to a historically black church. And she did some sort of birthday routine with Stevie Wonder. And here's what that sounded like. Feeling the vibes? Feeling that joy, are you? little pitchy dog. I mean, listen, Stevie Wonder is 74 years old, so I get it. But by the same token, if that's how you're spending your weekend in the closing days of the campaign, you got a problem. Meanwhile, here was Donald Trump over the weekend. So Donald Trump went to the Steelers Jets game. Here was his reception at the Steelers Jets game.
And then a woman ran onto the field waving a pro-Trump sign during the Jets-Steelers game as well. Again, there's a Pittsburgh crowd. This is in the middle of Pennsylvania. So she's campaigning with Stevie Wonder for her birthday, and he's at the Steelers-Jets game getting standing ovations and having people run onto the field with pro-Trump signs. And that wasn't the best thing that Trump did all weekend. So the left is losing their minds this morning because Donald Trump did something unthinkable. He went to a McDonald's and he worked the fry station and then he worked the drive through window. Now, this is like old school politicking in the United States. It's charming. It's funny. It was meant to highlight the disconnect between what Kamala Harris says she is and what she is. So you'll recall that she has now claimed multiple times that she worked at McDonald's while she was a college student. And there's some fairly serious questions about whether that's true or not. She has yet to name which McDonald's she actually worked at. There are no records of her having worked at McDonald's, so far as anyone is aware. The Washington Free Beacon has done some pretty deep research on this, and they've concluded that they can come up with basically nothing other than her word that she worked at McDonald's. Okay, why is that a big deal? It's not really a big deal, except that it undermines any claim of authenticity that she has, because she is completely airsat. She is the vinyl of actual human beings. She, she is not made of anything organic as a candidate. So Trump goes to this McDonald's in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which of course is the same place where somebody tried to assassinate him. And he works the drive through window and he looks perfectly authentic in there. He looks totally comfortable around the fry station. He looks like he's having a good time. By the way, you can tell a winning campaign from a losing campaign by who's having a better time on the campaign trail. Losing campaigns are relentless and grueling and annoying. And the candidate seems weathered and, and doesn't want to be there. And that's how it feels with Kamala Harris. Trump, meanwhile, I mean, again, I've seen President Trump like a week ago in person. Right? We, we went to the OHEL together in New York. I had him on the show. Donald Trump is in a very good mood. He is definitely enjoying this campaign. Kamala Harris is definitely not enjoying this campaign. Just like Hillary Clinton, she cannot explain why she's running neck and neck with Donald Trump at this point in time. So Trump shows up at the drive-thru and, um, and he's working in the drive-thru. And here is what it looked like. Thank you, honey. Have a good time. Thank you. It's cute. This is fun. I could do this all day. I wouldn't mind this job. I like this job. I think I might come back and do it again. Thank time. you. Look at that. Look at that. How are you? Thank you, Mr. President. You made it possible for ordinary people like us to meet. Uh, you're not ordinary. I mean, thank you so you much. You are not ordinary. I can see. We pray for you. And uh, you are the type of person we want to be the president. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So nice. Thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah, I took a photo. That's right. Thank I you, guess. Mr. President. When you think about it, I guess that's right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Beautiful wife. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. He, I got to say, he's great at this. Okay, I'm sorry. This is like great old school politics. I don't care whether you like Donald Trump or you hate Donald Trump. He is excellent at this. It's, it's a special quality that some politicians have, some figures have. He is amazingly good one-on-one -on -one with people. So President Trump, I, inter I introduced him to the family of a hostage down, that, that's being held in Gaza, an American citizen. And President Trump speaks to people as though they're family. That, that is how he talks to them. And so here you can see it. People are driving up. He's having full conversations with them. Donald Trump enjoys humans. Kamala Harris doesn't look like she's ever met a human, at least not when she's day drinking. And so he looks super comfortable. He's over there working the fry machine. He, uh, he posted a TikTok video about always wanting to work at McDonald's and how she had uh, a phony story about working at McDonald's. I'm looking for a job, and I've always wanted to work at McDonald's, but I never did. I'm running against somebody that said she did, but it turned out to be a totally phony story, so. President Trump! Well, that's a good-looking group. Hello, everybody. Crazy! I'm Arthur having a lot of fun here, everybody. Oh. Little thank yous of it. I'm sorry, that is a great photo op. Okay, because it turns out that Americans, you know what they really like? McDonald's. They really, really like McDonald's. It's like a historic American food chain, the most historic American food chain. And you just work in the fry counter as though it's totally normal for him, a billionaire. And he looks totally comfortable. I'm not sure a lot of other politicians would be able to get away with this. Seriously, it would look completely fake. For Trump, it doesn't look fake at all. That dude eats McDonald's like all the time. This is a dude who, when he was the actual president of the United States, he had a giant meal sponsored at the White House in the, in the giant White House reception room that was just filled with fast food from places like McDonald's. And you can see he connects with the normal voter very, very, very well. He's not on stage with Stevie Wonder. He's out there connecting with the average everyday voter in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I mean, look at these pictures. First of all, I have to, I have to admit, 
that this is an AI generated campaign. It just feels like this is all an AI hallucination. Look at these pictures. Here's President Trump reaching out, talking to a person in the car. He's handing them a McDonald's bag. See, and that's how I defeated crime. The hamburger, bad, terrible guy, died like a dog. Here he is working the fry counter, looking perfectly comfortable. I mean, honest to goodness, his tie color matches the McDonald's red. It, it, it's pretty phenomenal. I mean, this is just a great campaign, and people were out of their minds upset. Super duper duper upset. Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post and MSNBC. It's like, did Donald Trump violate campaign finance laws by working in a McDonald's? Like, this is what you got. This is your connection with the American people. Did Donald Trump violate campaign finance laws by working the drive through at a McDonald's in Bucks County, Pennsylvania? Good luck with this one. Trump also stopped by a McDonald's in Bucks County today where he worked briefly as a fry cooker without a hairnet, I might add. He also said he was paying for some of the meals. How is that not a campaign finance violation? Anyway, when Trump showed up, he once again falsely claimed that Vice President Harris lied about working at McDonald's as a college student. You know, it's kind of hilarious how Harris is so living large, rent-free, and Trump's strangely coiffed head that he felt it necessary to put on this political stunt. Well, I mean, I feel like he's living rather rent-free in your head when you're talking about campaign finance violations for him paying for somebody's Happy Meal. Seriously. Well, speaking of living rent-free in your head, maybe when it comes to your business, you've been thinking about AI recently. Well, you should be because it can make a huge difference in your business. We're already working with AI here at The Daily Wire on a wide variety of subjects. AI is amazing. Seriously, it's incredible. It might be the most important new computer technology Ever. It is storming every industry. Literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up for the change. The problem is AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how can your business compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle does. So you can now train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you're not using AI for your business, you're missing out. You're falling behind. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber 8x8 and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash Shapiro. That's oracle.com slash Shapiro. Oracle.com slash Shapiro. Do not let the left outpace you in the AI race. Get on OCI today. Also, betting online with Bet Online. It's a ton of fun. Beyond traditional sports, Bet Online gives you the option to bet on political events, like the outcome of the presidential election. Betting market's currently favoring Donald Trump a little bit. Or if you're a sports fan, Bet Online makes sports betting more accessible and convenient than ever before. Producer Jake has been using Bet Online to get in on this election's action. Jake bet on Trump back when his odds to win the election were even. Now Jake's bet is looking pretty good because Donald Trump, as we say, has become the slight favorite. With just a few clicks, you can place bets on your favorite teams or events from the comfort of your own home. Bet Online prides themselves on their higher than average betting limits of up to 25 grand. And you can increase your wagering amounts by contacting their player services desk by phone or email. So while you're watching your favorite team or the news on upcoming elections, why not spice things up with a friendly wager over at Bet Online? Go to betonline.ag to place your bets today. Use promo code Ben for a 50% sign up bonus of up to 250 bucks. That's betonline.ag. Use promo code Ben. Bet Online. The options are endless. You can spice up this election or a sporting event. Go check them out right now. Betonline.ag. Place your bet today. Use promo code Ben for a 50% sign up bonus of up to 250 bucks. Meanwhile, Trump, by the way, again, he's there, he's garrulous. He's like telling people, they, they, the media are asking him questions as he's working the drive through They ask him about Kamala Harris's birthday. It's like, happy birthday to her. <laughs> Donald Trump, you can tell when he's in a good mood. When Donald Trump is in a bad mood, he gets mean. When he's in a good mood, he's very generous with everyone, including his opponents. Here we go. Today's Kamala's birthday. She's turning, it's Kamala's birthday? She's turning she's 60. 60. Years old. Do you want to say anything? Yes, I would say happy birthday, Kamala. She's turning 60. Did you get her some fries? I think I'll get her some flowers. Why not to beat her Maybe again? I'll get her some fries. You're right. That might be. I'll give, give her some McDonald's. I'll get her a McDonald's hamburger. Thank you. No, it is her birthday. Well, it is I, true, right? I, I, I Happy birthday, you. Kamala. Happy birthday. Why See you later. Bye. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Brad, Trump. Trump. Okay, again, that's great. I'm sorry that he's doing the campaign right, and she is doing the campaign wrong. And it wasn't just the McDonald's stop over the weekend. The Al Smith dinner was held over the weekend. So the Al Smith dinner is sort of this signal Catholic dinner that happens every presidential cycle where the candidates show up and they make a bunch of jokes about the other guy and about themselves. And Kamala Harris ditched it. So Kamala Harris doesn't show up. Maybe it's because she likes abortion all the way into the ninth month. 
Maybe it's because she's the children, whatever it is, her priorities do not match the priorities of Catholics. It's a major problem for her campaign, given the fact that somewhere between one fifth and one quarter of the swing voters in Michigan and Pennsylvania are Catholic. And they are turning against her in large numbers. Jim Gaffigan, who is not a Republican by any stretch of the imagination, he has expressed ire at Donald Trump before. He's most famous for being a somewhat family friendly comedian. He was ripping into, but he's a Catholic. He was ripping into Kamala Harris. Why didn't she show up? Anybody could have shown up. Like she was invited. She could have shown. She didn't. I mean, this is a great way to piss off Catholics right here. 22% of Americans identify as Catholic. Catholics will be a key demographic in every battleground state. I'm sorry, why is Vice President Harris not here? (laughs) I mean, consider this. This is a room full of Catholics and Jews in New York City. (laughs) This is a layup for the Democratic nominee. (laughs) I mean, in her defense, I mean, she did find time to appear on The View, Howard Stern, Colbert, and the longtime staple of campaigning, the Call Her Daddy podcast. Uh, Jim Gaffigan, sounding like me up there. I mean, by the way, the reason she doesn't want to appear in front of Catholics and Jews in New York City, it turns out a lot of Jews in New York City, not huge Kamala Harris fans, again, given the fact that she has been making time with the pro-Hamas contingent and the Catholics, not real hot on Kamala these days, given the fact that people like Gretchen Whitmer are doing videos mocking Catholic rituals like communion. Here is Jim Gaffigan going off on the Democrats again. Again, this is not Trump. This is Jim Gaffigan at the Al Smith dinner over the weekend. You know, this has been an interesting presidential campaign. The Democrats have been telling us Trump, Trump's reelection is a threat to democracy. In fact, they were so concerned of this threat, they staged a coup, <laughs> ousted their democratically elected incumbent and installed Kamala Harris. In other words, all her dreams have come true. Really? It really makes you consider the power of prayer, right, Cardinal? (laughs) Sometimes prayers take three and a half years and a George Clooney op-ed. Wow, brutal hit there from from Jim Gaffigan. Again, Jim Gaffigan is not a Republican by any stretch of the imagination. So what did Kamala Harris actually do for the Al Smith dinner? She decided to send a truly insulting skit with Molly Shannon from SNL playing a Catholic schoolgirl because there is nothing that Catholics love more than characters who are specifically designed to mock Catholics. They love it. They love it so much. They love it when Molly Shannon plays a stereotypical Catholic schoolgirl from Saturday Night Live, Mary Catherine Gallagher. And again, her character is a mockery of a Catholic schoolgirl. Molly Shannon, by the way, is currently 60 years old. She's the same age as Kamala Harris. So you have two 60-year-olds showing up in a video, a skit video for the Al Smith dinner. This is legitimately comedy death. I mean, th- this is comedy arsenic. I- we'll see how much of this I can get through before all of my brain cells are dead. But I mean, wow. This, w- this was her entry into the Al Smith dinner sweepstakes here. Woo. Your eminence and distinguished guests, the Al Smith dinner provides a rare opportunity to set aside partisanship. Cool. Sorry, sorry. Hey, what's going on? Who was that? Oh, sorry, Mary Catherine Gallagher. Mary Catherine Gallagher. It's so nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Mary Catherine. Right now, I'm trying to record my speech for tonight's dinner. Oh, yeah, I know. I just want to say that I'm Catholic, and tonight is one of the biggest dinners next to the Last Supper. It is a very important dinner, and it's an important tradition that I'm so proud to be a part of. Sometimes when I get nervous, I stick my fingers under my arms, and I sim on like that. Mm. Mm. But that's gross. So tell me something. Um, I'm giving a speech. Do you have some thoughts about what I might say tonight? My feelings about what you should say tonight would be best expressed in a monologue from one of my favorite made-for-TV series. Okay, let's hear it. Don't you see, man? We need a woman to represent us. A woman brings more heart, more compassion. And think how smart she must be to become a top contender in a field dominated by men. It's time for a woman, bro. And with this woman, we can fly. What series was that from? Oh, that's from House of Dragons, now streaming on HBO Max. Is there anything that you think that maybe I shouldn't bring up tonight? Um, well, don't lie. Thou shall not bear false witness to thy neighbor. 
Indeed, especially thy neighbor's election results. Just so you know, there will be a fact checker oh, there God. tonight. Oh, God, please stop it. Please oh, stop it. I can't, great. I can't. I cannot. So she outsourced her comedy to Molly Shannon, who was never very funny and certainly is not funny now. And her campaign jokes are about why she should be president of the United States, but it's put in the mouth of, of Molly Shannon. So that's what the, she sent to the Al Smith dinner. It was kind of critical that Kamala Harris show up to this dinner and she didn't. But let's talk about something else critical, sleep. You know, the thing you're probably not getting enough of because you're worrying about the state of the world. Well, here is a solution. It's called Helix. Now, I don't endorse products lightly. Helix has seriously changed my life. They've got a whole lineup of mattresses, 20 different options to be exact. They've got Deluxe for those of you who like to feel like you're sleeping on a cloud or the Elite for when you want to take your sleep game to the next level. Even the Helix Plus for our friends who need a little bit of that extra support. Plus, you don't need a degree in mattressology to figure out which one is right for you. Just take their sleep quiz. I took it myself. They match me with a medium firm mattress, which is great because I get back pain if the mattress is too soft. Get this. Helix delivers your personalized sleep solution directly to your door. No hassle, no fuss, just pure comfort shipped straight to you. Plus, they're really confident in the product. They give you 100 nights to try it out. If that wasn't enough, there's a 10 to 15 year warranty. Talk about standing behind your product. So if you want to sleep as soundly as I do, head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take that sleep quiz. Plus, Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders. Just head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. That's helixsleep.com slash Ben with Helix. Better sleep starts right now. Meanwhile, Trump is in the room and Trump is having himself an amazing time. I mean, truly an amazing time. So Trump starts off by joking about the fact that Kamala is not there and uh, and joking about her her gorgeous laugh. I must say I was shocked when I heard that Kamala was skipping the Al Smith dinner. I'd really hope that she would come because we can't get enough of hearing her beautiful laugh. She laughs like crazy. <laughs> we would recognize it any place in this room and all polls are indicating I'm leading big with the Catholic vote as I should be as I should be. But I don't think Kamala has given up yet. She hasn't instead of attending tonight. She's in Michigan receiving communion from Gretchen Whitmer. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is good stuff. Meanwhile, this is my favorite moment, I think, of the evening, the Al Smith dinner. So Chuck Schumer shows up and Chuck Schumer is just a snake. I mean, Chuck Schumer is the worst. <laughs> but Chuck Schumer, who spent like the last 10 years, talking about how Donald Trump is a deep abiding threat to democracy. He's sitting right next to Donald Trump. So Donald, Smith, Donald Trump's at the podium. And just to Donald Trump's left is Chuck Schumer sitting there grimacing. And Donald Trump starts to troll Schumer, like in front of him. And it's pretty great. Chuck Schumer is here looking very glum. <laughs> Doesn't he look glum? He look glum. <laughs> <laughs> but look on the bright side, Chuck, considering how woke your party has become, if Kamala loses, you still have a chance to become the first woman president. <laughs> By the way, Schumer reacts to him because here's the thing. For all the stuff the Democrats say about how this guy is Hitler, do you think they would have gone to dinner with him if they thought it was Hitler? Do you think Chuck Schumer would be sitting next to Hitler at this dinner as Hitler made jokes about him and tapped him on the shoulder and ribbed him good-naturedly? The answer, of course, is no. So that's why we all know it's a lie, because that's not who Donald Trump is. And you all know it. And your last vestige of a defense for Kamala Harris, that Donald Trump is orange Mussolini, is ridiculous. Obviously so. I don't know who Trump's joke writers were, but they were some of the harshest people in the world. I'm there for it. So as you all know, I have a thing about people slamming Doug Emhoff. I love it. It's my favorite thing. Doug Emhoff is the worst person in this race. He's a two-faced, lying, awful human being who pretends that he's like this beta male uber dad, when in reality, he's stooping the nanny and beating up his ex-girlfriend. In any case, I didn't write this joke, but I certainly could have. Here was Donald Trump going after Doug Emhoff. A major issue in this race is child care, and Kamala has put forward a concept of a plan. A lot of people don't like it. The only piece of advice I would have for her in the event that she wins would be not to let her husband, Doug, Anywhere near the nannies, just keep them away. That's a nasty one. That's nasty. <laughs> I love when Trump reads the joke for the first time. He's like, that's so nasty, but I'm so glad I said it a little. That wasn't his uh, most nasty joke of the evening. His most nasty joke of the evening uh, was about white dudes for Harris. So in front of all Catholics, he decides to get a little blue right here. There's a group called White Dudes for Harris. Have you seen this? White Dudes for Harris. Anybody know? Are, are some of you here? White Dudes for Harris. Doesn't sound like it. 
but I'm not worried about them at all because <laughs> their wives and their wives' lovers are all voting for me. <laughs> oh, he's such a meme lord. My goodness. My goodness. He, uh, he completed his, uh, his joke set by going after Tim Walls. Again, in the, in the harshest possible way. But unfortunately, Governor Walsh isn't here himself, but don't worry, he'll say that he was. He's going to say he was. <laughs> I used to think the Democrats were crazy for saying that men have periods, but then I met Tim Walsh. <laughs> Just brutal stuff. Michael Bloomberg sitting right in front of Trump. Chuck Schumer sitting right next to Trump. I mean, it's pr pretty glorious stuff. Again, Donald Trump's having a good time. And the Democrats are losing their mind over this sort of stuff. So they, they're very upset about Trump and McDonald's. How could he? It's because he's crazy. So Matt Drudge, who for some reason has become sort of the avatar of left-wing angst about Donald Trump, he has an entire headline at his website today saying, one fry short of Happy Meal with an AI image of Donald Trump dressed up as Ronald McDonald. This sort of stuff is not going to play. It just isn't. They tried this over the weekend. They also tried to suggest that at the Al Smith dinner, it was so, how could he come and make jokes? Terrible. Maureen Dowd has an entire piece in the New York Times ripping on, wait for it, Cardinal Timothy Dolan. Why? Because Cardinal Timothy Dolan laughed at Donald Trump's jokes. Yes, Maureen, that's clearly the threat to Catholicism in the United States is that Cardinal Dolan laughed at Donald Trump's jokes at a comedy dinner. The threat to Catholicism in the United States is certainly not the party that has attempted to sue the little sisters of the poor into the ground for not providing abortion care. It's certainly not the party that has decided that men can be women, women can be men, and Catholic charity should be shut down if they try to have children adopted by traditional married couples, male, female. Probably the great threat is Donald Trump, Maureen Dowd acting all miffed on behalf of Catholicism. Just ridiculous. She writes, quote, Timothy Dolan let a white tie charity dinner in New York showcase that most uncharitable of men, Donald Trump, the cardinal, should go to confession. That's a hell of a statement. The cardinal should go to confession. Why don't you talk to the Catholic hierarchy about whether Cardinal Timothy Dolan ought to go to confession? Or maybe you ought to, considering every political position you've taken for the last 20 years on matters of interest to Catholics across the country. At the annual Al Smith dinner, she says, Dolan suffused the impious Trump in the pious glow of Catholic charities. Dolan looked on with a doting expression as Trump made his usual degrading scatological comments about his foils, this time cloaked as humor. We have someone in the White House who can barely talk, barely put together two coherent sentences, who seems to have mental faculties of a child, Trump said. It's a person who has nothing going, no intelligence whatsoever. But enough about Kamala Harris. Oh, no. And then people laughed? Catholics laughed? You're right. The thing Catholics must be worried about right now is Maureen Dowd's perception of Cardinal Timothy Dolan. You wonder why Kamala Harris has a problem, folks? This is why Kamala Harris has a problem. They were also very upset, by the way, over Donald Trump making a joke about Arnold Palmer. So Donald Trump told a joke about Arnold Palmer while he was on the campaign trail over the weekend. He was talking about Arnold Palmer, the famous golfer, and he suggested that, uh, that Arnold Palmer, shall we say, was well endowed. Here is what Donald Trump said. This became a full weekend media cycle. This is what happens when your own candidate sucks beyond all possible recognition. Arnold Palmer was all man. And I say that in all due respect to women and I love women. But this guy, this guy, this is a guy that was all man. This man was strong and tough. And I refuse to say it, but when he took showers with the other pros. They came out of there. They said, oh, my God. That's unbelievable. <laughs> I had to say it. I had to say it. We have women that are highly sophisticated here. But they used to look at Arnold as a bed. But he was really something special. Okay, so this became a 48-hour media cycle where the media just kept asking every Republican about Donald Trump making a joke about Arnold Palmer. You think anyone cares? Like, truly? Guys, you can't have it both ways. Either he is, you know, so bizarre, he's so he's so crazy, such a goofball, or he's a Hitlerian figure who wants to destroy the country. I'm sorry, the dude making jokes about Arnold Palmer. I, I just don't think that he is in the back room putting together his coup plan for destroying the Supreme Court or something. Like, what, what the hell is wrong with you? It, so, if you're relegated to being angry at Donald Trump for doing the Al Smith dinner, or for working the McDonald's drive-thru, or for making a joke about Arnold Palmer, let me suggest your campaign is losing. 
Also, the polls suggest her campaign is losing. And the real reason that Kamala Harris is losing is because she is a liar. She has always been a liar. The entire campaign is reliant on hiding who Kamala Harris is. Kamala Harris is an empty vessel. She's an empty vessel that tends to be filled with the most radical left positions when she defaults. But she is, in fact, an empty vessel. She is a facade. She's a Potemkin village of a candidate. And everyone can see that. So over the weekend, there were a there were two separate incidents in which Kamala Harris was protested. The way that she reacted to the two protests is extremely indicative of who Kamala Harris is. It's pretty incredible. Okay, so I, I, I give you these two protests back to back. Protest number one, she is campaigning. And in the middle of one of these campaign events, this one happens to be in Wisconsin, pro-life voters start chanting at her, yelling at her. And you can hear the crowd, right? You can hear the, these protesters at this rally shouting, Jesus is Lord. Hey, now, here's the thing. You don't have to be a believer in Jesus. You don't have to be a Christian to recognize that in the United States, a huge percentage of the population is Christian. Also, there are some of us who are not Christian who believe that it's a wonderful thing for more Christians to go to church. Certainly, it is the apex of political ineptitude to suggest that you don't need Christians as part of your campaign. That is a nutty position. But that's exactly what Kamala Harris does here. So people are shouting, Jesus is Lord. Here is her response. Donald Trump hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with, with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade, and they did as he intended. Oh, you guys are at the wrong rally. Oh, you guys are in the wrong rally. Okay, so that's a bit telling. You have pro-life protesters who are shouting, Jesus is the Lord. And she's like, you're at the wrong rally. Right? No respect for them, no respect for their beliefs, no respect for Christianity. They're none. Okay, that is incident number one. Then there's incident number two. She has another rally. This one was taking place in Milwaukee. And protesters started asking her about the quote-unquote genocide in Gaza. Now, to be absolutely clear, there is no genocide in Gaza. That's not how genocide works. Typically, when a genocide takes place, that means the attempted slaughter of an entire civilian population, for example. The population of the Gaza Strip has been reduced, presumably, in terms of the number of people killed by the IDF, by perhaps 40 to 45,000, the vast majority of whom are terrorists or close terrorist affiliates. That is not what a genocide looks like. In fact, today, there's lots of film coming out of Jabalia, where Israel is trying to clear the ground of terrorists, and they're trying to clear the area of Israeli soldiers providing medical care on the ground, handing people water bottles as they move along. That's not how a genocide works, typically. So Kamala Harris has protested, and somebody says Israel's committing genocide in Gaza, and here is her response. And it is for that reason that I say, and Mark knows, I am so invested in you all in every way. And in genocide, sure right? You billions of dollars in genocide? The, Excuse me. Billions of dollars in genocide you invested that in? I, you know what? I respect your right to speak. I'm speaking right now. I know what you're speaking of. What is I this? want the ceasefire. I well, what want about the genocide? Done. I want the war to what end. What about the genocide, and though? I respect your right to speak, but I am speaking right now. Yeah. You're not speaking about genocide. Yeah. What about genocide? Billions of dollars, 42,000 people dead. 19,000 children are dead. 19,000 children are dead, and you won't call it a genocide. Well, I know what you're speaking of. What is I it? want the ceasefire. I but what about the genocide? What about the genocide? I respect your right to speak, yes. but I am speaking right now. Woo! Yeah! yeah. So, so, listen, it, what he's talking about, it's, it, it's, it's real. And so that's not the subject that I came to discuss today, but it's real. And I respect his voice. I respect his voice. It's real. So just to get this straight, you're pro-life, you're protesting the ability in the United States to kill babies late term because of people like Kamala Harris. Not only does she not respect you, you're at the wrong rally. You say Jesus is Lord, you're at the wrong rally. You say Israel is committing a genocide. It is factually false. There is no genocide happening. That is clear by every available statistic. It also happens to be clear by the actions of the IDF who are acting the most targeted urban environment in the history of warfare. And she says, it's real. She says, it's real. Okay, that, that's who Kamala Harris is. 
You wonder why she's losing? That's why she's losing, because she is two-faced. And when the face slips, what you get is radical San Francisco leftist Kamala Harris. Nothing about Kamala Harris's actual agenda works. She keeps pushing it anyway. But let's talk about something that does work, efficient business finance management. You want to know how to run your company's finances smoother than a well-oiled machine? You need to check out Ramp. Ramp is a corporate card and spend management software designed to help you save time and put money back in your pocket. Ramp gives your finance team unprecedented control over company spending. You can issue cards to every employee with actual limits and restrictions, a novel concept in today's world of runaway expenses. Ramp's accounting software automatically collects receipts and categorizes your expenses in real time. No more chasing down receipts. Your employees won't waste hours on expense reports. That allows you to close your books eight times faster. Unlike most so-called money-saving solutions, Ramp actually puts cash back in your pocket. Businesses using Ramp save an average of 5% in their very first year. Plus, it's easier to set up than my son's Lego sets. You can get started, issue virtual and physical cards, and start making payments in less than 15 minutes, whether you have five employees or 5,000. Right now, get 250 bucks when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash Shapiro. That's ramp.com slash Shapiro, R-A-M-P dot com slash Shapiro. Cards issued by Sutton Bank member FDIC. Terms and conditions do apply. Also, time is, you know, our most precious resource. You lose it, can't get it back. Since I'm constantly on the go, I'm always looking for ways to maximize efficiency. You know, it used to eat up a lot of my day when we first started the company. Mailing and shipping, believe it or not, that's where stamps.com comes in. There's a reason we've been using it for a decade at The Daily Wire. It's the time saver you need if you're spending hours dealing with legal documents, checks, or marketing materials. With stamps.com, you can cut down hours spent on mailing and shipping. You can do it on your timeline. From mom and pop shops to multi-location organizations, stamps.com handles all your mailing and shipping needs wherever, whenever. Plus, if you sell products online, you can seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Here's the kicker. You can access USPS and UPS mailing services directly from your computer or phone anytime, day or night. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. It's like having a 24-7 post office directly at your fingertips. Free up more time for more important business with Stamps.com. Sign up at Stamps.com, enter code Shapiro for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and free digital scale. No long-term commitments, no contracts. That's Stamps.com, code Shapiro. Go check them out right now. We've been using the Daily Wire ourselves for years. It's good enough for us. It's definitely good enough for you. Go check them out right now. Stamps.com, Code Shapiro. So who is Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris is a radical leftist, and that's particularly true with regard to Israel. She's stuck between a rock and a hard place because her own priorities are with the pro-Hamas crowd, but she wants to pretend that she's a moderate because there are a lot of liberal Jewish donors who have a sort of passing interest in what happens with Israel. So, for example, she was asked by a journalist whether she's going to lose this election over Gaza, and she just word salads this thing. Here, here is a full heaping serving of some word slaw from Kamala Harris. Do you think you could lose the election because of Gaza? And what, you know, overnight, um, there were more strikes, 32 more people were killed in Gaza, some in hospitals. Um, you know, how risky is it that you could lose the election? Well, it is undeniable that Uh, It is something that everyone is aware of what is happening there. I speak publicly all the time about the fact that uh, there are so many tragic stories coming from Gaza. And, of course, the first in this phase of everything that has happened, the first most tragic story um, is October 7. Okay, no, she's rambles and rambles and rambles. But where does she actually stand? Where does Kamala Harris actually stand? Why don't we ask? One of her campaign surrogates, Bernie Sanders, who literally went on CNN and just said the quiet part out loud, which is that if she were president of the United States, he would work with her to to create a full arms embargo against Israel. If we are able to elect Harris, I think we're going to have an opportunity to move her on that issue, to make it clear we cannot allow children in Gaza to starve to death. She will be open to that. I doubt that Trump will. We can't even get Republican support in the Senate for humanitarian aid to feed starving children. You really want to vote for a Trump who holds that view? I would hope not. That's who Kamala Harris is. Kamala Harris, Bernie Sanders, same person. It's just that she has to pretend that she's a different political priority. By the way, speaking of the Democratic administration and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and what they've done on Israel, So while I was on break, it was a Jewish holiday. Unfortunately, the Jewish holidays this year happen to fall in the middle of the week, so I've missed a few days of broadcast time. While we were off, Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas, was killed by an Israeli strike. So that happened when, effectively speaking, Israeli soldiers stumbled on him. He had been forced out of hiding because the Israeli soldiers in Rafah, you remember Rafah? 
Rafa was the place that the administration had said not to go. Rafa is a place that Joe Biden had said Israel should not enter under any circumstances. Turns out one of the reasons Egypt and Hamas didn't want Israel to go into Rafa is because guess who was hiding there? It was Yahya Sinwar and all of his buddies. Here, for example, is a flashback from March of Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, telling Israel they certainly should not go into Rafa. It would be a complete disaster, humanitarian catastrophe. It wasn't. Israel moved out all the residents with minimal loss of civilian life. And then it turns out they found Yahya Sinwar there and killed him. But here is back in March, Jake Sullivan in all of his military acumen explaining that it would be terrible if Israel went into Rafa. The president has rejected and did again today the straw man that raising questions about Rafa is the same as raising questions about defeating Hamas. That's just nonsense. Our position is that Hamas should not be allowed a safe haven in Rafa or anywhere else. But a major ground operation there would be a mistake. It would lead to more innocent civilian deaths, worse than the already dire humanitarian crisis, deepen the anarchy in Gaza, and further isolate Israel internationally. So he was wrong, as he was always wrong, because the Biden administration has been wrong about everything forever when it comes to foreign policy. So. Over the course of the holiday, I believe it was on Wednesday. So Israel had flushed Sinwar and some terrorists out of these tunnels. They'd been basically uncovering tunnel after tunnel in Rafah. They were running out of places to hide. So Yahya Sinwar was running around with a bunch of terrorists in a place where there were no civilians. Rafah is currently occupied only by terrorists. He was near the Egyptian border because there was always the possibility he could try to smuggle out through a tunnel at the Rafah border. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that Bibi Netanyahu, despite all the international criticism and domestic criticism in Israel of him, has insisted that Israel keep control of the Philadelphia corridor. That's the border between the Gaza Strip and Egypt, because he was saying they're going to smuggle terrorists through people like Yahya Sinwar. He was right. His critics were wrong. That is the simple fact of the matter. So Sinwar is running around in this area with three other terrorists, and he's spotted by essentially just reserve trainees in the IDF. Like a 19-year-old who'd been in Gaza for three, four months spots these terrorists. They start shooting at the terrorists. They kill three of them. Sinwar runs back into the building. There's a rocket launch that goes into the bottom floor, wounds him. He then climbs up to the second floor. And then a drone, the Israelis send a drone to check out to see whether he is still alive, whether he's dead. They didn't know this is Sinwar at this point. They just knew that it was a terrorist. So they fly a drone in. Here is the footage of the drone going into this area. So for those who can't hear, you can see the drone goes in. It's difficult to spot Sinwar. He's covered completely in dust. He's sitting on a chair. He's obviously wounded. The drone focuses in on him because they can see that he's there. And eventually, Sinwar tries to throw a stick at them. Okay, this is not an act of heroism. He's a coward. He has subjected 2 million Palestinians to the retaliation of the IDF because he is a terrorist scumbag who hid beneath all the civilian population with billions of dollars for years on end. His wife was spotted on October 7th, by the way, carrying around a $32,000 handbag. So here he is trying to fling a stick at the, at the drone. Uh, it does not work out well for him because shortly thereafter, an Israeli tank fires around in there and that's the end of Yahya Sinwar, who, uh, who has now met his maker and hopefully is suffering for uh, all of the suffering that he has caused. In any case, Israel kills Sinwar. Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, who again was stalwart in his recognition that Israel had to go into Rafah, that defeat of Hamas was the only possible solution to this war. He was right. His critics were wrong. It is that simple. Here was Netanyahu saying they're going to win. By the way, over the weekend, Hezbollah, backed by Iran, fired a drone at Netanyahu's house in Kesaria, in Caesarea, which is about halfway down in the country, a little bit south of Haifa. It's a beautiful area. I've visited there many times. They actually apparently hit a window in, in one of his houses in Caesarea. And here he was saying, listen, you can try this, but you're going to lose. I mean, we've, Israel has now killed the entire leadership infrastructure of Hamas. They've killed the entire leadership infrastructure of Hezbollah. And Iran is cruising for a bruising as well. Here's Netanyahu over the weekend. Prime Minister, how is it going? Well, two days ago, we took out Yechia Sunwar, the terrorist mastermind whose goons beheaded our men tell women, burnt babies alive. We took them out. And we're continuing our battle with Iran's other terrorist proxies. We're going to win this war. So will something deter you? No. Okay, so meanwhile, here was Joe Biden's reaction to the death of Yahya Sinwar. The death of the leader of Hamas represents a moment of justice. He had the blood of Americans, Israelis, Palestinians, and Germans, and so many others 
on his hands. I told the Prime Minister of Israel yesterday, let's also make this moment an opportunity to seek a path to peace, a better future in Gaza without Hamas. Okay, what a joke he is. A path to peace? The path to peace is the surrender. The surrender. By, by the way, Sinwar was offered surrender. Egypt said, we'll negotiate a deal for the hostages and you go into exile. And he said, no. Okay, Hamas continues to be the sole party responsible for this conflict. Meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi is being trotted out there to criticize Netanyahu, the war leader of an allied country. Has she ever said anything like this about Vladimir Zelensky? Ever? We just a few days ago observed one year anniversary of a terrible assault on Israel by Hamas, a terrorist group dedicated to the destruction of Israel. Sadly, since then, we've seen many casualties of uh, non-combatants, uh, children and families in Gaza and now some elsewhere in the region. And it's, it's just intolerable. Uh, we cannot, um, we, war has to be outlawed as a resolution of any conflict or disagreement. But right now, we have to live with the circumstances that we have. We've all been talking about a two-state solution for a long time for Israel and for the Palestinians. Uh, the current leader in Israel does not agree to that. Uh, I don't know if Netanyahu wants peace. I don't know if he's capable of peace. I don't know if he's afraid of peace. This is the Democratic But party. he has gone off the course afraid that of peace. we all what, thought we were. What, what a terrible person Nancy Israel. Pelosi is. Truly. And so the Democratic Party overall, terrible, terrible. I mean, this is the greatest underreported story of the last couple of weeks, actually, is that a pro-Iranian account leaked alleged U.S. intel on Israel's attack plans, according to Axios. Hey, Barack Ravid, who's a stenographer for the White House, quote, U.S. officials are extremely concerned about a potentially major security breach after two alleged U.S. intelligence documents about Israel's preparations for an attack on Iran were published by a Telegram account affiliated with Iran. The alleged leak comes as Israel completes weeks of preparations for retaliation against Iran, which attacked Israel with a barrage of ballistic missiles on October 1st. A Telegram channel by the name Middle East Spectator claimed on Friday it had received documents from a source in the U.S. intel community about Israel's preparations for an attack on Iran. The documents are, in fact, authentic. How did this happen? The answer is the entire Biden administration, the executive branch, the intel community, honeycombed with pro-Iran forces who hate Israel. The Biden administration knows full well about this. This is not a shock. They had Robert Malley, who was a cutout for the Iranians, working as their negotiator with Iran. There are people who are currently in staffing positions. Like, for example, Aryan Tabatabai, the chief of staff of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations. She's an officer in U.S. Naval Intelligence. And um, when invited to Saudi Arabia, she emailed and asked the Revolutionary Guard officer, Mustafa Zahrani, I would like to know your opinion. Would you be interested in this? There's a full investigation into her, and then they left her in place. So you have an administration that is honeycombed with people who are fully willing to publicly leak Israeli intel in order to stop Israel. That's who Kamala Harris is inheriting, and that's who she is. Well, folks, meanwhile, when things begin to fall apart for a campaign, they really begin to fall apart for a campaign. So the campaign surrogates for Kamala Harris, let's just say they are not doing an amazing job. So over the past few days, there was an event that Joe Biden attended with Barack Obama. It was the funeral for Ethel Kennedy. And um, it didn't go amazing. The New York Post had somebody do a lip reading of the conversation between Joe Biden and Barack Obama. Joe is still really pissed off that he's not the nominee considering he won all the votes. And then they literally took it away from him and just handed it to Kamala Harris. And so here he was lamenting Kamala's weak candidacy. And Obama's nodding along because they both know you're not supposed to say it publicly, but she is a bad candidate. Obama says, no, 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 that's not on. I'm talking about the microphones. Obama says, I think it's important that we have some time together. We'll take it at value. She says, yes, that's right. Maybe we can. She's not as strong as me. That's right. And, and Obama says, I know, that's true. And then Obama says, we have time. And Biden says, yeah, we'll get it in time. Will you, though? Will you, though? That's the big question, because even her campaign surrogates having a very tough time explaining why she should be president of the United States or how she's different from Joe Biden. So Josh Shapiro, who's the person who is not chosen for Kamala Harris's vice presidential campaign, because, uh, of course, he's Jew and that's not allowed in a party 
where Jews are a little bit uncomfortable. So Josh Shapiro was asked on Meet the Press about the differences between Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, and he could name precisely zero. I understand what you're saying, Governor, but polls do show that more Americans feel as though President Biden's policies have hurt them rather than help them. So can you name one key policy difference between Vice President Harris and President Biden? How would her administration look different? You know, I've been really encouraged by the amount of energy that Kamala Harris, Vice President Harris, has put into focusing on how she will cut taxes for small businesses. The focus on child care tax credit expansion. That's something I've done here in Pennsylvania. We've seen that work to ease the burden on families. I, I think a focus on those kinds of things is particularly important. And those are the kinds of things I think Kamala Harris has brought specifically to this race. Th those aren't necessarily differences, though. They're an expansion or uh, a tweak to some extent to what's been done. Can you name one policy difference? Well, listen, I, again, the contrast I am focused on, Kristen, is between her and Donald Trump. Amazing. Amazing. So literally no differences between her and Joe Biden. We all know this, but they just they keep saying it out loud. Meanwhile, Lizzo is out on the campaign trail. Nothing says person of the people like Lizzo, who did an entire TikTok video about getting on her private jet to go campaign with Kamala Harris. Again, remember, this is the party that's mocking Donald Trump for working at the drive through window in solidarity with kind of everyday Americans. And meanwhile, they are trotting out Lizzo to explain that if Kamala Harris becomes president, the entire country will be Detroit. She meant that as a positive. She's trying to respond to the fact that Trump said that as a negative. Now, most Americans, if they think of Detroit, they don't think of a wonderful place to live because it turns out Detroit is a pretty terrible place to live. It used to be a wonderful place to live. And then the Democratic Party thoroughly destroyed the city and has not yet recovered. Lizzo is out there saying, don't worry. If Kamala Harris becomes president, then all of you can live like people live in Detroit, which sounds pretty nightmarish, actually. I'm so proud to be from this city. You know, they say if Kamala wins, then the whole country will be like Detroit. Okay? Proud like Detroit. Resilient like Detroit. Uh, that's not what uh, Donald Trump means, and that's not what anybody thinks of, Lizzo. Well, how about DNC chair Jamie Harrison? Well, he is uh, so Baghdad bobbing this thing. And we are now at the point where he says that Kamala Harris is like Michael Jordan in the NBA Finals. That that would be if, if Michael Jordan never played in the playoffs, was immediately just shoveled into the NBA Finals where he proceeds to go 0 for 12. Uh, here we go. Watching the VP right now is like uh, watching Michael Jordan in, in the NBA Finals. She's hitting every shot. I mean, you, we saw her this week in the interview she did this week. We saw her handle hecklers at, at her... Oh, uh, recent event. I mean, she is in a zone right now that none like I've ever seen in the politicians in, in a very, very long time. And so what it is, is that we got to do our part as the role players on this championship team. We got to pull down the extra rebounds, get the assist, make sure she, she has a ball in her hand because she's going to she's going to shoot it and it's going it, to it's going to it's going to go in. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Just keep talking yourself into this one. Meanwhile, speaking of, of making those tough shots, it's like that time that Jordan hung in the air and then and then made a jumper over Craig Elo in the playoffs. Is it just like that? Here's a Kamala ad directed at black men. Apparently, she believes that the way you win black men over is by lecturing them about how they will never get laid if they don't vote for Kamala Harris. Hello, ladies. I'm Trey. It's good to be here. What do you do and how much do you make? I work in finance, making six figures. How tall are you? Six five. Do you have a plan to vote in November? Nah, not my thing. And then it's a bunch of these women all popping balloons because they're showing they would never date him unless he's going to vote for Kamala Harris. Uh, just a note for all dudes. If a woman says she will not date you because you're not voting for Kamala Harris, you don't want to date her. That's going to be a nightmare. Alrighty, guys, get ready because in just one week, the decade's number one grossing documentary is coming exclusively to Daily Wire Plus. That is correct. Am I racist? Starring Matt Walsh, it arrives Monday, October 28th. You need a Daily Wire Plus membership to watch it. We made it easier than ever by putting our memberships on sale. Head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code DEI for 35% off your new Daily Wire Plus membership. Am I racist is, of course, our epic troll of the left. It shocked the box office with its success. But taking on the establishment is not, in fact, a cheap enterprise. Making a movie, getting into theaters across the country, that's a monumental, costly endeavor. We're doing the work, but we can't do it without your support. Join us right now. We need your help. 
We are fighting the left. We're building the future so we can keep standing up for you. So join us. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe today. Become a member. Get ready for Am I Racist? Streaming exclusively at Daily Wire Plus in just one week. Okay, guys, coming up, we're going to be getting into Elon Musk on the campaign trail. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro. Check out for two months free on all annual plans. Click that link in the description and join us. The question everyone in America is asking, am I racist? Make those moves. Get a Daily Wire Plus membership <laughs> to see Am I Racist? This is all I have. Did you, did you want to? I can help you guys out. Yeah. Go to amiracist.com and sign up now. I've been told because I'm a white male, kind of at the top of the pile, how do I get down from the top? I don't think you necessarily can. <laughs> we get past all the uh, talk about racism. We have to love each other. Well, it can't be that simple. How do we get to a point of racial harmony? It's good to talk to you. Mm -hmm. We're still on a journey, all of us together. I think you got right. some journey in to do. Just talk to me about the statistics. We have the epidemic. 20 million crimes a year, 6,000, 7,000 hate crimes. No, there's no epidemic. Why are we talking about statistics? This is not an, a matter of statistics. Well, we, you asked me about the statistics. Am I Racist? Coming to Daily Wire Plus on October 28th. Rated PG-13.